there's a whole rationale, it's called military Keynesianism, that, um, and you can go back and read the documents at the time, they're very open about it, you know, we had the Great Depression, and they tried all kinds of things to get us out of that. We were still in it when the gin up 1940 to the Second World War started, and you go look at the production numbers and the economic numbers, and the graph is almost straight up, right? So then in 1943, when it's clear that the war will be over in a couple of years, and it turn, you know, it's like an arm wrestling match and it's, it's too far gone, they start thinking, okay, well, what happens when we turn off the spigot, mm -hmm. right? Because I had a, a, a great uncle who had a small little rubber uh, plant in, in Orange County before the war. When the war started, the government gave him a huge amount of money to buy up all the land, you know, we need all the, you know, all of it, right? And then after the war, they simply said, do whatever you want with it. So he sold it and made a fortune just on selling the land. But that's the spigot, right? That's the tech. So there was this feeling that we could go right back to the Great Depression if you didn't keep the spigot on, right? This unnatural amount of cash coming from taxpayers to military to build stuff that we might not even need, mm -hmm. but it keeps jobs going. That's the thing. If I told you that we could get out of all these countries and the world would be fine, you might say, that sounds great. But if I said, yes, but we could also lose 250,000 jobs of people in the defense set, then you have to say, okay, right. is it, but then one must ask, are these real jobs or are these jobs where, you know, Dave Rubin's tax dollars is basically transferred to a guy who works in the defense? I mean, right. you know, and is that really capitalism? You know, we, we, we go after the socialist countries for being socialist. How different is it? Military Keynesianism is a kind of a socialist. Right, we're, right. We're just transferring it in a yes. different way. And then when we way. don't want the stuff, this is where you know it's a bit of a shell game. Because if we were really concerned with defense, you would not give your best equipment to other people, right? You would not say, this is our new M1 Abrams tank and we have <laughs> it. But then when you give it to other people, what does that mean? That means they have the same stuff you do, which means you've got to go build better stuff. Right. So it becomes a, 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 a make work program, if you will. So how much of it is just that, that maybe this thing has grown so big, talking about budgets and military and all that, that t reining it back in would almost be impossible. But do you think it's possible that we've maybe gotten too big that somehow turning it back could have repercussions that we can't even imagine? Well, first of all, start with when you have a corrupt political system, um, take for example the question of tanks. We just brought up tanks. Well, there's a famous story happened, I don't know, six months, a year ago, where it was a bit of a scandal because the government doesn't want any more tanks. Military does not want any more tanks. We have right. lots of them. But they build tanks in important districts that have senators mm -hmm. who then go and argue that, you know, you would decimate my local economy if we weren't building. So they're building more tanks than the military says they want because we have to keep the work. See, the military also smart. They locate. Uh, and I love the U.S. military, by the way. I'm a military history guy. But but they locate the various important facilities in places where there are powerful politicians and what have. So you have a real reason. I mean, if you talk about cutting defense, you're going to have, for example, congressmen down in Southern California who have marine bases that depend on that money, that feed families, that go into the local economies. But again, do you have a defense department for that? Is that what you and and if you got rid of that? Does that mean you will suffer, or does that mean you know the, the true believers in capitalism would say, okay, then you will reallocate all that, right? Mm -hmm. If you believe that, and you know I'm more of a pragmatist, it's an ideology, but but those funds will be relocated to more productive measures. It'll be a form of creative destruction, if you will. Um, I think that's that's a, a more logical question. Like if you talk about cutting the defense budget, for example, by 20 percent, the problem with that is you haven't cut the mission. If your job is to be the global policeman of the world, mm -hmm. we're not spending enough now. So you have to match the funding. Well, I would argue that's a problem too. Yes, you have <laughs> as to, I think you, you would have agree to match with me. the funding yeah. to the mission, yeah. right? If our job is to defend the United States of America, we are wildly spending too much money. Right. Okay. So, so here's the thing that never gets debated. You know, it's like the dog that didn't bark in Sherlock Holmes. The, the subject we never debate is allowing the American people a voice in the foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Because if the American people are allowed to decide the foreign policy, we don't have this foreign policy. And everybody knows it.